Another jab-related bill bites the dust. The controversial bill would have allowed minors to consent to receiving any vaccine. It was pulled just hours before lawmakers voted on advancing the bill to the governor. Several parent organizations told me about their efforts opposing the bill. California State Senator Scott Weiner announced Wednesday morning that he is pulling Senate Bill 866. The now dead bill would have allowed children 15 years and older to receive any vaccine without parental consent. Several parent organizations gathered in Sacramento for a rally against the bill also on Wednesday morning. Tara Thornton, co-founder of one of those groups, revealed the bill's history. The, originally the bill was for all children 12 and up. There was so much bipartisan pushback and community pushback that the author against his desires was forced to take an amendment to take it up to age 15. Still, even with that amendment, it didn't shake the bipartisan opposition within the legislature or from the community at large because this isn't about anything but age. And it's we will not negotiate our parental rights and lower the age of consent on important medical decisions below 18. Lawmakers support and opposition was split in the state's two houses. Nicole Pearson, lawyer and founder of Facts, Law, Truth, Justice, was planning on filing a lawsuit if the bill turned into law. She says lawmakers are trying to separate parents and children. It's actually another brick in the wall that the California legislature has built between parents and children. Another, another brick in the divide between parents and children, and quite frankly, not only a parent's moral and ethical obligation to take care of their child, but actual, actually their legal obligation to take their children, and, and it's a huge violation of that. Weiner said in a Wednesday statement the decision to pull SB 866 came after he realized the bill would not receive enough votes to pass. He thanked the coalition of students, health care providers, and parents who supported his bill. Amy Bonn, president of Protection of the Educational Rights of Kids, said there was a celebratory mood on the Capitol steps after the bill was pulled. Us working together, collectively holding the line, all of the people who are engaged, um, calling their legislators, being up at the Capitol, all the work that's being done, it, it is a tremendous effort, I have to say, um, on behalf of everyone that you know, we've come this far. On Tuesday, Denise Aguilar, fellow co-founder of Freedom Angels, called on parents to take more civic action. Our call to action is to show up, show up and listen to the organizations and the parents who have been pushing back on this and really show up to the assembly floor session. This is the last day for any bills to pass and go to the governor's desk. And we really, uh, we, we encourage people to be a part of this process to engage in civics. SB 866 was one of the many jab-related bills that was not only introduced under pandemic lockdown policies, but also failed to pass amid pushback. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. A national civil rights group known as FAIR has urged California's government to revise its gender policies. Here are the details. California's government is receiving new calls to revise its gender policies. The policies in question would require teachers and other school staff to hide students' gender identities from their parents if the child wishes. The state's Department of Education policies encourage schools to, quote, socially transition children who say they are transgender. This includes allowing them to use preferred names and pronouns. In addition, they could dress as the opposite gender and use opposite sex bathrooms without parental consent. The nonprofit Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, or FAIR, has also advised other states with like-minded policies to pursue a course to revise these policies. Letitia Kim, managing director of the organization's legal network, said, you can't just leave it entirely within a child's hands, particularly given that the child is not developmentally mature enough to make that kind of a determination. Although these policies may seek to protect children, Kim says they go too far. She also said FAIR will consider litigation if nothing is done to revise current policies that exclude parents from the process. David Lamb, Entity News, California. While it's not always the case, everyone has heard, as California goes, so goes the nation. And this time, it seems to be happening with the state's sought-after gas car ban. Several other states are jumping on to banning sales of such vehicles. 
following the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, adopting rules seeking to restrict the sale of new gas cars in the state, Washington, Massachusetts, and Virginia, could implement similar measures. According to CARB's new rules, zero-emission vehicles and plug-in hybrids should make up 35% of new cars sold in California beginning in 2026. States such as Massachusetts, Washington, and Virginia already have trigger laws in place to restrict the sale of new gas cars if California passes such a rule. But California's law becoming a reality will depend finally on a ruling from the Biden administration. John Bozilla, CEO of Alliance for Automotive Innovation, said in a statement on Thursday that the push for replacing fossil fuel vehicles with electric vehicles first requires fulfilling other basic requirements that will determine the success of such a plan. California has been under a state of emergency for over 800 days with no end in sight. One senior policy analyst points out the problems that come with it. While the state of emergency may have been necessary during the pandemic, it has also led to thousands of no-bid contracts, bypassing the standard formal process of evaluation and contractor bidding. Mark Joffe, senior policy analyst with Reason Foundation, told California insider C.M. Karami it gave Governor Gavin Newsom extraordinary powers to do just that. An example he brought up is when the state needed lots of masks. So the original uh, mask contract went to a company called Blue Flame, which had been set up uh, three days before uh, the contract award from California, when uh, California uh, wired the company about $450 million to prepay for the masks. Uh, fortunately, the state was saved by a bank. The bank looked at this wire payment, thought it was very suspicious, and decided to disapprove it. So. Um, because of a bank's intervention, you know, California taxpayers and federal taxpayers would also have been footing most of this bill. With no bid contracts, the vendors are chosen informally and contracted. The state found another company and signed a $1 billion contract with it for masks in a hurry. BYD, to, uh, which is a Chinese company that um, I think originally started more in the automotive sector, um, and they claimed that they could uh, perform, the, you know, perform the service of quickly procuring a lot of masks. But there were problems there because some of those masks did not meet federal certifications. There were delays in providing them. So even though we spent a billion dollars, we the taxpayers again of California, it's not clear that we got value for, for money there because there was such a hasty assignment of these contracts. Jaffe says normally when government procures goods or services, it writes a request for proposal. Companies bid on that request, then the government agency goes through a process of reviewing all those bids and chooses the vendor that meets its requirements. But this time, they were not prepared to scale up to the huge amounts of money getting spent so quickly. Jaffe says this authority to declare a state of emergency started in the 1970s when the Emergency Services Act was passed. This gave the governor very broad authority to declare a state of emergency and there's a very long list of things that can be co uh, categorized as an emergency situation including pandemics, uh, droughts, um, forest fires and, and so forth. So the governor has a lot of flexibility in terms of declaring these disasters or emergencies and then suspending the normal legislative process for as long as um, he or she thinks necessary. According to Jaffe, the legislator would have to vote to end the state of emergency, but it doesn't usually happen since it would transfer the burden of responsibility to them. Angry residents are protesting against the latest movie that started filming in their Los Angeles neighborhood. They say it attracts dangerous illegal street takeovers in their area, trying to replicate the stunts, making it unsafe. Production of the latest The Fast and the Furious movie, Fast X, was underway in Los Angeles on August 26. But angry protesters nearby demanded an end to filming in their neighborhood. For Damien Kevitt, founder of Streets Are For Everyone, who organized the protest, it's a personal issue. He lost part of a leg after being hit by a vehicle. This community has been requesting for years to handle the fact that it's become a tourist destination for street racing ever since the first Fast and Furious film. And to have it, the films be filmed again 
in this neighborhood, this, the community is concerned that it's only going to get worse. At nighttime, you're, you're woken up quite a few times. And then your kids are crying and screaming because they're in terror of like, what the heck is going on? Um, it's, uh, it's become a big problem for us. And I think enough is enough. The franchise has made billions of dollars in its 21-year run, with some of the film's iconic scenes shot in the neighborhood. But residents of Angelino Heights near downtown LA say they've had enough of movie fans performing dangerous stunts and trying to recreate their own versions of the movie on public roads. We can't even have our kids sitting in front of the house because they're scared. Because we're scared that if something gets spun out of control, it's going to come flying in your property or you're towards your children, so you can't have that. You can't cross the streets because you're not, your kids aren't safe to do that. Dozens of protesters marched outside the closed set as camera rigs were set up and a vehicle used in the movie was transported behind privacy screens, guarded heavily by security. Campaigner Lori Argumedo held up a picture of her niece who was killed by a street racer. Bethany was 23 years old. She had her whole life ahead of her. She had a little girl that was six years old. I had to identify my niece's body on Mother's Day. I had to tell her six-year-old daughter that her mommy is never coming home. She still doesn't understand that mommy's never coming home. This is the reality of street racing. People's lives are lost. I did her makeup for her funeral instead of her wedding. The production company should speak up and say, have their idol actors speaking up and voicing how this is not okay. Speak up for the people that get to suffer accidents like this and say, this is not what we promote the movie for. The Los Angeles Police Department says there have been reports of 667 takeovers since the start of 2022, with more than 2,000 citations issued and 439 vehicles impounded. Other police data suggests there have been around 600 arrests this year alone. Dangerous illegal street takeovers, where crowds, sometimes in the thousands, take over a busy road or intersection. They block it off for races and stunts, hampering police attempts to get through the crowds quickly and make arrests. Many of them are filmed for social media. We want NBC Universal to live up to their social impact statement. We want them to care about the communities in real life, not just on a website, on words, and to mitigate the impacts and to do effective actions to stem this rising problem. They are helping to glorify it. NBC Universal did not respond to a request by Reuters for an interview. As the heat wave approaches, staying healthy and hydrated is critical. But don't forget about your pets. Dogs, cats, and other animals can suffer greatly from overexposure to heat. NTD's Bill Thomas brings you more. Pet owners are being urged to take precautions to prevent their furry four-legged friends from becoming a victim of the searing heat and hot pavement. Pasadena Humane, a nonprofit animal resource center near Los Angeles, says heat issues can lead to a spike in veterinary visits. Pasadena Humane has a few tips for protecting your pets. Keep them hydrated with plenty of cool water and provide shade if your pets are outside. Avoid exercising pets during the hotter part of the day, early morning or later evening are better. Those times will also protect your dog's paw pads from burning on asphalt, cement, or other hot surfaces. Pets showing signs of heat exhaustion, such as excessive panting, heavily salivating, or suddenly becoming immobile should be taken immediately to a veterinarian. Don't end up in the doghouse. Please take care of your pets. Bill Thomas, NTD News, California.